Hello, everybody. I would like to welcome you to the annual Sage 100 Year End Tips and Tricks webinar. Um, I am Mary Hildinger. I'm going to do a little bit more of a formal introduction here in a few minutes. I've had the pleasure of working with a number of you who are here today. And we're going to just spend some time covering some topics that are usually of uh, importance and of pretty good interest as far as what do we do um, really not only at year end, but also what we might consider doing on a more regular basis. Um, if you can hear and see okay, this is wonderful. If not, we have Leah Peters uh, who can help get you connected and her phone number is area code 260-399-8649. Um, she'll be happy to help you out if you're experiencing any technical difficulties. For those of you who have been to some of our DWD webinars in the past, just a reminder uh, for those of you who have not been here at all, what we do is we request, uh, we keep everybody muted because there are so many of us in here today, uh, but there is a questions box or a chat box that you can use to forward questions. Um, you also can do a raise hand function, that's in your control panel. Uh, if we get a question that is of um, what we feel would be like really, really, really important that we need to share with everybody, we will absolutely take that question and we'll bring it to the attention of everyone. Otherwise, we've got uh, some people behind the scenes here helping me this afternoon who can uh, respond to your questions on the fly as we go. And uh, again, my name is Mary Hildinger. Um, I think many of you have seen me do this presentation in the past. And then we also have David Overholt with us today. Um, David and I have been doing this thing for quite some time. And um, David's always here to help answer questions. And we also have Leah in the background. So she is participating as well and will help monitor questions with us. Hello, David. How are you doing today? All right. For those of you who need CPE credit, um, please let Leah Peters know her email address, lpeters at dwdtechgroup.com. Today is a two-part session. The first part is going to focus on um, core modules, in, uh, accounts payable, accounts receivable, a little bit of inventory, general ledger. The second part, which is its own separate hour of CPE, is going to focus on the payroll side of life. So if you attend both sessions, you can request two credits of CPE. If you only are in attendance for one, uh, you can request that credit of CPE. And we do have to adhere to our rules of a 50-minute um, course presentation for us to be able to grant you that CPE. So that's a little bit of the welcome <clears throat> today. Excuse me, what we're going to talk about, uh, we'll give you a little overview of who DWD is. If you are not familiar with us, uh, we want to share who we are and what we do. We're going to talk a little bit about some uh, important announcements with regards to the Sage 100 software. We're going to talk about what we do for closing modules and how, why we do that, the order in which we do it, and then we'll talk a little bit more about what kinds of things happen as a result of closing modules at the year end or really at any period. Um, <clears throat> we'll have a short break between the core session and the payroll session. So if you are going to stick around for both halves, please uh, don't, you don't have to leave the meeting. You can just stay with us and we'll restart at the top of the next hour. So who is DWD? Uh, DWD Technology Group, we are a division of Doolin Ward and DeWald CPAs uh, located in Fort Wayne, Indiana. We have our technology division of which David and Leah and I are a part. Uh, that was established back in 1990. We do have three primary locations comprised of accountants and technical support people. We have a staff of approximately 65 people and almost half of us are in the technology group. So we can do software and business consulting with you. We have ex expertise in manufacturing, distribution and accounting functionalities. 
And you'll notice that we've had a couple of award recognitions by um, different pr uh, publications that are important to the accounting and the technology world. What do we do? Software. We do a lot of different kinds of software. A large focus of our software is with the Sage family. Uh, Sage 100 is our primary manufacturing and distribution uh, uh, software. Sage Intact is our web-based offering that Sage has recently, like over the last few years, been uh, getting out into the world. Uh, we have Sage Business Works. Some of you have come off that platform and into Sage 100. We also work with Sage 50. Again, a number of you have come off that platform and have moved into the Sage 100 world. From a not-for-profit perspective, there is the MIP Fund Accounting. Uh, we also have expertise in Sage Fixed Assets, Sage HRMS, that's a human resource management software, and also Sage CRM, which is a contact or a customer relationship manager software. What other things do we do? Uh, as a software team, we help train, we help support your software, we help you set it up. We certainly help facilitate upgrades and customizations. We have a number of guys on staff who are capable of writing that magical little code behind the scenes that when you push a button, it does something the way you want it done. Um, we can help with custom report writing. We can help you with your data conversion. A big area that we focus on is systems integration, where we take the Sage 100 solution and we integrate it with other pieces and parts. Uh, much of the time is related to warehousing and barcode systems. We also offer um, business intelligence services, uh, Power BI, if you're familiar with that, Microsoft Power BI, um, Sage Alerts and Workflows. There are third-party solutions for manufacturing efficiencies and work order scanning and work order efficiencies. Um, and then, of course, the uh, website integration. We can help with um, custom needs in that regard and then the Sage CRM, getting your sales force out into the real world and yet still having the connectivity to the Sage data that they need. So in years past, I've done this webinar, <clears throat> excuse me, many, many, many times, and yet I'm still a little anxious every time I do this because I just wanna make sure I do it well for you. Um, we have talked in years past about this, these three letter acronyms. And I always used to chuckle because I, I think acronyms are fun. So I came up with a TLA, a three letter acronym, right? But these acronyms, the IRD, that was the interim release download. Some of you who've been around the solution for a number of years, remember that we have to get that IRD installed. And then those of you who have used payroll uh, and come up through the ranks, you might remember having to get the tax table updates installed. Well, the news is that neither of these things is available for Sage 100 anymore. Um, last year was the, the last time that Sage released an IRD. And with the advent all the way back to Sage 100 2018, the tax table updates no longer became necessary. So we're gonna spend a couple of minutes talking about that here. And then for the payroll folks, if you stick around, we're gonna hammer it home pretty hard again. So to the point, do I need to install an IRD? Nope, no more. They are no longer being distributed. However, the caveat is that if you are still going to process your payroll tax forms and your 1099 forms, that's on the AP side, we need to help you make sure that you are running Sage 100 version 2020 or higher. Uh, if you are not running a compatible version of Sage, you will not be able to get the updates. You will not be able to access Atrix in order to get the downloads for the forms that are required. And starting with the latest payroll release, uh, Sage uh, payroll 2.24.0, Sage will only be supporting the current version, current minus three versions for payroll updates and um, any of the things that we need to do to keep the software current. 
So we have a lot of folks who will put the software in and they, they just are comfortable, they're happy with it. But now we're getting to a point where we have to get people moved up in order to stay current, in order for you to stay um, compliant. So what does that look like? Well, right now, the current version of SAGE is 2023. The current payroll that is out there is 2.23, actually 0.2. And I keep checking that over, I've been checking that over the last few days because I want to know exactly when 2.24 comes out. Uh, so 2023 is the version of SAGE 100 that is the most current. SAGE will support version 2023, 2022 and 2021. So technically, even though some of you folks are on 2020, um, you can't necessarily get support from Sage. We can still run the tax information, um, but af after next year, no, we will have to make sure that we get you moved up to a current platform. You'll have to work with your reseller to get moved up to a more current platform. Um, as you can see, the payroll tax update, the tax calculations occur in the Sage Tax Cloud. That's why we don't have to push the um, tax table updates into our software anymore. Sage actually gives them to us. Many of you might recognize, hey, do you, you have a, a tax update? Do you want to install it? So those kinds of things are, are becoming more and more prevalent in the industry. We are not going to get that infinite support from versions that are really, really, really old anymore. And really, really, really old actually happens to be just a few years old these days. So keep in mind, check what version you're running. If you need help figuring that out, let us know. We can, we can help you get to that. So we're going to talk about um, closing modules. This is always the biggest question, especially this time of year that I get. What do I need to do to get my modules closed? What does it mean when a module's in a certain date compared to what other dates might be running? Um, as far as the closing process, this is a general list of the modules from Sage. And we're gonna even note a little tiny discrepancy here because work order is now called production management. So um, the bill of materials module would get closed first, then production management. If you're using the barcode module from Sage, that would need to get closed. Purchase order, sales order, inventory. And then as we move into the core accounting modules, uh, we'll see things like the material or inventory requirements planning. Um, time card and payroll kind of live together today. So those would effectively close at the same time. Receivables, payables, job cost. If you're using job costs, that actually is next to last. And then the general ledger module is the one that we always close last. So what does it mean to um, be in a certain period with a certain module? We know that in Sage, each module may close independently of any other module. In general, unless we've got other system settings in place, we have the ability to post really into the future as far as we want. And sometimes, unfortunately, we make those mistakes at year end where we're, we're punching things in in the wrong year. Um, the general ledger module is the typical driver that once the general ledger module gets closed, we cannot post backwards. So um, that's why that's usually the last module that closes. And of course, when we do the closing process, it is really strongly recommended that we make a copy of the company first because if something happens during the middle of the closure, um, something inadvertent, it could be a, a power outage or what have you, that could corrupt information. And if we have that backup, we can always restore that backup to be able to move forward. So if we're talking, I'm gonna talk mostly about AP, AR, a little bit about inventory and the GL, because those happen to be the most common modules that pretty much everybody has. So when we talk about accounts payable, um, we, and we want to close that module, what we need to do, it is ideal that we, we make sure that all related data entry is updated and posted. 
So not only AP invoice data entry or checks, manual check and payment entry or the check printing functionality, but we might have modules that are related to accounts payables. Perhaps we have a purchase order, um, a receipt of invoice that we've done, or we have job cost postings that are talking to vendors or production management or work order transactions that are related to some sort of specific vendor. So we have to make sure that all of those transactions are updated and posted. And then what do we like to do next? Well, we certainly want to make sure that we print reports that we think we're going to need. And it would be ideal to get a baseline of that report right before you close and, and really right at the end of the year or the end of the period. Some people take a couple weeks to close their modules or close their periods, and that's perfectly fine, but things can change in that time frame. So if we get that snapshot right on the last day of the month for things like the AP aging report, the AP trial balance report, a check history report, these things can help you identify what might have transpired if you're not actually getting to your closing for a couple of weeks, we can see what the differences are because we can still run these aging reports and the trial balance reports and the check history reports as of a specific date. And if we know what our baseline is and then we rerun that report and there's something different, then we know we might need to look at something because we either didn't post something in the right period or really we are okay and that baseline just wasn't ready to go. Now, a lot of people ask about the AP aging report and the trial balance report. Um, that Those are two slightly different reports. They come at us with two slightly different presentations. Uh, traditionally, the aging report is based off the invoice document date, whereas the AP trial balance report is based on the date that those invoices posted, so the general ledger date. And this is why SAGE recommends that we use the AP trial balance report to help facilitate the reconciliation between our AP details and our AP general ledger. And of course, the history report gives us all the goodies as far as what checks we wrote and when we wrote them. What happens to the accounts payable module data when we close the period? Um, some things that can happen. Um, we get some reports that might get some information closed out. Um, predominantly, anywhere that we see a monthly type of report, we might find these in other modules as well. Monthly means the current open period. So if I'm running some sort of a monthly purchase report, and then I close my period and I go back to rerun that monthly purchase report, I'm not going to be able to look at that prior period anymore because that period has been closed. Um, we have some history reports and that is based on options where we choose how much history we want to hold on to. In the more current version of SAGE, the default length of time is nine years we can go to as few as two, and we can go up to 99 years of history that we keep within our company. Obviously, these are settings that you get to choose and realize that if you make that number bigger, it's not going to recover those things that have already been purged because that history time has elapsed. So especially if you're starting new, uh, we wanna consider using a longer period of time so that we can hold on to more information. We can always make it shorter, but um, if we make it larger, we're not gonna recoup what might have already been purged. We talked about um, some of the options in at right now in accounts payable. There is a concept of number of days or number of months to retain paid invoices. What does that mean? Well, basically what that tells us is in our open invoice table, which is what the vendor inquiry and the vendor maintenance use to present to you those invoices on the invoice tab and the transactions tabs, how many 
days or months are we going to allow paid invoices to stay in our list so that when we finally do a closing anything older than that that has been reconciled and resolved drops out of the open list that doesn't mean that it's gone from history it just means that it's not as easily accessible because it's not at the vendor maintenance or vendor inquiry fingertip we can still go to invoice history, we can still go to payment history, and we can find those things based on the um, settings that we have for the number of days or the number of months or even the number of years of history that we can select. Starting with Sage 100 2020, um, the history files actually blossom. So rather than being capped at days, it's actually capped at months or years now that give us um, the amount of time that we can hold on to that information. So for those of you, I'm just going to do a real quick question. Um, use your raise hand function. Who all of you processes your own 1099s? These are the typically the non-employee compensation, the rent, the attorney miscellaneous fees. So yeah, I'm seeing a handful. There's a pretty reasonable handful of people here. So um, <clears throat> thank you for responding, by the way. As we have learned over the last number of years, there is a third party program. It's called the Federal and State E-Filing um, and reporting function that has to be installed in addition to our Sage 100 software. And it goes on the workstation or workstations from where these forms will get generated. Atrix is the driver of this particular tool. And they have worked with the Sage products for a number of years to facilitate these payroll and 1099 forms. How do I use Atrix? How do I, what do I get to do? Well, first of all, in order to get the download for the most current forms, you must be on an active maintenance or support plan. For the 1099s, if you are going to print and mail those forms, you must use the red pre-printed forms. The miscellaneous forms are a two-part form, the NEC, the non-employee compensation. The red forms are a three-part form. The recipient copies may be printed on blank paper, usually a four-part perforated paper. Um, Atrix will also print the 1096, and if you are mailing this to the government, you must use the red pre-printed form. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, as a side note, back in 2020, the IRS, um, I'm going to say resurrected uh, because apparently this form used to exist years past, the NEC form. Um, so if you have people whom you are paying and they typically had been your non-employee compensation, it was the old box seven of the 1099 miscellaneous form, you must be filing these on the 1099 NEC form and box seven just doesn't exist anymore. Um, as was mentioned earlier, and as I'm sure I will repeat over and over and over again this afternoon, you need to be on at least version 2020 or higher in order to install the payroll 2.24.0 program or higher to get the Atrix updates. Again, we are not getting an IRD this year. And so the, the 1099 forms are coming through the payroll 2.24 and the Atrix tool that is also installed. I'm gonna pause for a second here. Does anybody have any questions about that thus far? All right, so that was the big hubbub about accounts payable. Let's talk about accounts receivable now. So in a very similar vein to what was recommended for the accounts payable side, 
the accounts receivable side, we also want to make sure that any related data entry is updated and posted. So we might not only have our cash receipts entries, if we are doing invoicing from the accounts receivable module, that's fine. If we are using related modules, such as the sales order module or the job cost module, we want to make sure that we have all of the data posted that we possibly can. If you charge finances, finance charges to your customers, then you might want to go ahead and process the finance charge, print your customer statements, and then also go through a list of those particular reports that might be beneficial uh, for you to keep on record period after period, especially at your end. Just like on the payable side, we have an aged invoice report that looks at the invoice detail date. We have the AR trial balance report that references the general ledger posting date, which might be different than your invoice date. Use the trial balance report as a means to help reconcile your details of your accounts receivable, your invoices to your general ledger. In an ideal world, the aged invoice report, either on the payables or the receivable side, the trial balance report, either on the payables or the receivable side, match the general ledger account. But we know it's not an ideal world, so we just have different tools that we use at different points to give us what we need and help us figure out what we need to do to get everything to line back up. These are some reports that might get um, clipped, if you will, once we do a period end processing and especially at a year end processing. Uh, so the customer sales analysis reports, the sales analysis by salesperson reports, the monthly sales report and the monthly cash receipt report. Those again, because they have that keyword monthly in there are viable for only the current open period. There are alternate reports that let us look at wider time spans, but we have to be careful on some of those monthly reports as to what period we're looking at and uh, are we getting the information that we want because we're in the right period or we're not in the right period. What happens when we do, especially in AR year-end processing? Um, some things that can happen, we've got uh, the number of days to retain paid invoices. This is very much like what we just talked about on the AP side. If I am looking at my customer maintenance or my customer inquiry screens, and I go to that invoices or transactions tab, I can see those invoices, whether or not they are completely paid in the two, those two tabs. But once I pass by, the number of days or number of months to retain paid invoices, then those things will drop away from my open view. They will still be in history for as long as I keep the history. And again, I can set um, a large number of months to be my um, time frame that I want to keep these particular documents in my open file. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, the, the uh, AR year end especially uh, purges the monthly cash receipts file. So again, that's why we want to capture reports, capture the information that we need, use paperless office. We don't have to print trees worth of reports, but we can store them electronically. And we can do that throughout the entire system. Not only do we get to save journals and registers and invoice forms and things like that. But we can also ask Sage to print reports and store them in our electronic filing cabinet. And then we can go back to them at any point in time. So uh, if you're not familiar with paperless office, I would certainly encourage you to reach out to your reseller. And if it's us, by all means, get a hold of us. Let us help you get that set up and let us show you how to do that so that we can get you to keep on those reports and not have to um, print volumes and volumes of pages to have that information accessible. 
So those are a couple of, <clears throat> I'm really sorry, I got a frog in my throat. Some, these are a couple of the, the primary modules. Pretty much everybody has AR and AP, right? I'm gonna talk a little bit about inventory. And I know not everybody has inventory, but there are a few things that just come up time after time after time. And I want to address that and make sure that everybody uh, who needs it can hear this. So again, when we go through closing the inventory module, either on a monthly or an annual basis, um, we want to make sure that all data entry is updated and posted. And again, because sales orders can feed off of the inventory, because purchase orders can feed off the inventory, we want to make sure that all of those related transactions are getting posted before we go through and we do this process. Um, in the period end folder in inventory, there is a functionality that is called the negative tier report and the negative tier adjustment register. Many people are like, what is this? How does this work? Why is it here? In Sage 100, if you are using a tier based inventory valuation method, in other words, FIFO, LIFO, lot costing, or serialized costing. It is possible with some of these costing methods that we can drop our inventory into a negative situation. In Sage 100, when we replenish that inventory, it does not automatically replenish the layer, the cost layer that went negative. It just creates a new layer at the appropriate receipt date for the quantity and the new cost of that item. So I might have an item that appears to have nothing on hand, but when I look at cost details for that item, I will see a negative cost layer and a positive cost layer quantities. And what might even be weird, more weird is that those costs for the negative layer versus the costs for the positive layer might not be the same number. And so we are not properly stating our inventory valuation because we have a mismatch between the pluses and the minuses. The negative tier report allows us to see those items that are in a negative situation by warehouse and then when we run the negative tier adjustment register, Sage goes behind the scenes and it will take any positive quantities that are available and it will merge it into the negative tier layer, hopefully wiping out that negative tier layer. And any cost differential then would be thrown into our inventory adjustments account, which is typically a cost of goods account. So, as we're doing our closings, we want to run that report, run that negative tier report. We want to run the negative tier adjustment register. If we're doing physical counts, some people do that once a year. Some people do that 12 times a year. Some people might. Um, there is a process that we can go through where we can freeze that inventory. We can print a count worksheet and then we can enter and update those counts. Now, the cool thing about Sage is that when we freeze that inventory, we've put in a baseline of what the quantity of inventory should have been at the time we started the count. And then when we report those counts, we need to report what is there irrespective of what other activity might have occurred in the meantime. Um, some systems that I have worked with in the past pretty much lock you out of everything when you freeze that inventory and you can't do anything. You can't do purchase order receipts. You can't do sales order invoices. You can't move anything because inventory is locked up. In Sage 100, that is not necessarily true. Some people choose that because it makes it easier for them to get an accurate count and get all that stuff plugged in before they open back up for business. Other people don't, they're not able to shut down. And so they need to continue to do business. So when I report a count, I need to make sure that that count is getting reported as it 
would have been without regard to any interim activity. And if you've got questions on that, we will absolutely be glad to walk you through it and help you understand that process. Some other things that we need to do at the end of the period, um, we print the yeah. inventory evaluation report. And again, I really recommend getting this one as yeah. a baseline report because the, the typical inventory evaluation report is as of the here and now. So whenever I run that report, that's what the valuation is. Uh, today is December 6, 2023. And if I'm trying to run an inventory valuation report, I'm going to get where does my inventory stand as of 12, 6, 2023. There is an inventory valuation report by period, which I has been able to back out. Hmm. Um, Uh-oh. I'm going to back up just a smidgen here, go back a previous slide just in case, and just recap a little bit here. So for inventory management, again, just very simply, make sure that you have all of your related data entry updated and posted. Go into the period end folder in inventory, run the negative tier report. If you have tiered valuation methods, FIFO or LIFO, update the negative tier adjustment register, merge those negative or over distributed layers with any positive cost layers that might exist. If you need to do your physical count, freeze your inventory, get your worksheets out, whether or not you choose to continue to conduct business while you're, you're doing your counts, just make sure that your people counting are aware that they need to count as if those interim transactions haven't occurred. Uh, print the inventory valuation report. So again, that inventory valuation report is right as of the here and now. So you might want to grab that snapshot, um, send it to a deferred printer, send it to paperless office because those can be very lengthy reports. Give yourself a baseline. This is the report that helps you reconcile your inventory details to your general ledger. There is an inventory valuation by period report, and it's pretty good. It used to not be very good, but it's better now than it has been. So feel free to um, take advantage of that as well. And then from the purchase order side, there's a similar report out there, the purchases clearing report. Again, that report is as, the, as of the here and now, and it needs to be run again take that snapshot on the last day of the year you may still be doing purchase order receipts of goods receipts of invoices what have you but give yourself a baseline give yourself something to compare to when you finally get to close your modules and there is a purchases clearing by history report we just have to make sure that that is enabled we have to make sure that you are tracking purchase order history um, the purchases clearing by um, purchases clearing by history, I think is the name of that report, has to be enabled in your role maintenance. Uh, it might not be visible on your menu, but if you are on a newer version of Sage 2020 or greater, uh, we should be able to find that report and we can enable that for your role. I am going to pause for a minute. Um, does anybody have any other questions? Can you guys still hear me okay? Good. I am get, thank you so much. I'm getting some responses on that. Um, you are welcome to chat questions and um, feel free to hit us up here as we go. The last section that I want to chat about here Oh, I do have a good question here. Is there an inventory report that is as, an as of date? And the short answer is no, um, unless you're doing the inventory evaluation by period. But, um, and David, you can correct me or help augment me with this. Um, there's not one that we can do in the middle of a month basically right and i don't know if you can hear me but 
we can run one as of the end of a prior period. And hopefully that helped answer your question. It looks like you made it back into the meeting too, so that's cool. All right, I'm gonna jump into the last chunk here. And this is our general ledger module. So this is kind of like the big kahuna. Um, once we close a general ledger period, it disallows us to post back into those historical periods. However, it's not the end of the world. We do have the ability to reopen the general ledger module. We just really want to do it with good reason. So, this is why the general ledger module gets closed last because the the thought process is that we get all the source modules closed and then by then we should have all of the adjustments we need for the general ledger either on the monthly or on the annual basis and just at, you know people ask me well how often should i close you know when should i close the general ledger and i always come back that the answer is up to you folks I have some people who haven't closed their general ledger in probably three, four, five, ten 10 years. I don't recommend that as a course of action because there could be some bad things that happen in the back, um, the back side of calculating general ledger balances. And um, I have some people who religiously close it on the first or second of the month. And then I have some people that just do kind of an intermediate type of thing. Uh, what they might be able to do is um, close it. They get their year end done for the prior year end. Once they had all their adjustments made for that fiscal year, they go ahead and close the GL. And then after that, they just wait until the next year end. That's okay. That's quite all right. Um, some people are real religious that they don't want that. Other people are a little loose, looser with that. Perfectly fine. But the key is just try to remember to get it closed regularly in some fashion. I do need to step back for a question here that was, um, oh, somebody else is taking care of that. Thank you, David, for answering those questions for me. I'm going to let you keep going. And I'm going to keep going with the presentation for a moment. So um, make sure all the other modules are closed. Print and update any recurring journals. So if we think about our general ledger main menu, we have our general journal entry, we have our recurring journals, and we have our transaction journals as a possibility. So the recurring journals would be those things that are repetitive period after period after period, a template that we just don't want to have to retype you want to make sure that you get those journals processed for the current month before you're ready to close it. And then any other adjustments that you do manually through general journal entry. Anybody who's using budgeting um, and you want to use the budget revision register, that can take your budget and it can take your actuals. It can take you know some figure of merit and it can project for you what your next year's budget is. You're welcome to do it that way. Uh, we have a lot of people who just choose to import the budgets because it's actually easier for them to do that. They can manipulate the numbers and get what they want into the correct period. Um, make sure that your trial balance is in balance. And that's an easy thing to do. You just run the report. And if it says it's out of balance, we need to stop and we need to, need to figure out when the last time it was in balance. And then we can figure out what's the source journal that caused it to go out of balance. So um, obviously debits must equal credits. And we absolutely want to make sure that that happens, especially at a year end. Some of you might use allocation journals. Um, those are um, templates that can take balances or amounts out of a um, main account or a home account, if you will, and redistribute to subsidiary accounts. Some people use those. Some people use the expense distribution tables in the accounts payable side. Again, if you're using them, you want to make sure that you update the allocations 
regularly for the balances that you're trying to reclassify. And then of course, any of the reports that you need, we want to make sure that we get a trial balance. You need to run your GL report, your financial reports, income statement, balance sheet, what have you. And then you can also run the general ledger detail report. So all of these reports can be run to paperless office if you don't want to print them physically on paper. Some trial balance reports, some general ledger detail reports can be extensive. And if you don't want to put that all on paper, but you still want a copy of it, let's run it to paperless office or print it to a PDF or do something uh, so that you have that snapshot in time. And then you have something at which you can look if in the future something changes drastically, we at least know where we were at a given point in time. What happens when we do the year end processing? So as we go through and we do our period end processing, Sage tells us, okay, you're in this month and you're closing into the next month. Okay, fine. And then when we get to the end of our fiscal year, Sage will say, okay, we are going to close our fiscal year now. What happens? What happens in the GL? Well, predominantly the net income or loss gets closed into the retained earnings account. And then based on the number of years to retain transaction history and the number of years to retain summary history, um, we might have the software recalculate what we call beginning balances. So if we're not keeping a, a super long period of history, if we go look into the raw data files, we're going to actually find a spot where there's, you know, record zero, the beginning of time. And the beginning of time has a particular value in it. Well, that could be as a result of many, many, many prior years closings and all of those things getting rolled up into what is considered the beginning balance. So again, we want to keep an eye, keep an eye on what history we're keeping and depending on how much history we're keeping, it might tend to recalculate those beginning balances. If we're not keeping enough history and we keep our GL open for too long, all kinds of weird stuff can happen. I know David can attest to it. I have been privy to that, seeing some strange calculations occur just because people are not being um, progressive in keeping their modules closed properly. All right, um, I have come to the end of my first set of ramblings. I, I have seen quite a number of questions pop in um, above and beyond the um, issue with the audio and I do apologize for that. As a reminder, this will come to you as a recording. Hopefully anything that might have hiccuped, uh, you might be able to recatch by way of listening to the video. Do we have any other questions that we can help address with you at this point? All right, as a reminder, this session is one hour of CPE credit. And if you need CPE credit, please contact Leah Peters. Um, make note in the line, you know, CPE, and you could tell her part one of year end tips and tricks. Uh, just so that she knows what to what letter to send out to you. And from that, again, I am Mary Hildinger. It has been a pleasure chatting with you. Uh, David, thank you so much for your help. And Leah, thank you for being here as well. Um, if you are not going to be partaking of the payroll, you are welcome to uh, take leave. If you're going to be sticking around for the payroll side of it, we are going to take a short break and we will come back uh, in about nine minutes. We're going to start at the top of the hour. All right, it is the top of the hour, two o'clock in the Eastern time zone and 11 o'clock on the Pacific time zone. Welcome back to the second part of uh, the annual year-end tips and tricks. And we are going to drill into payroll specifics. 
Um, again, if you are having any connection is issues, please contact Leah Peters, uh, area code 260-399-8649. Hopefully my audio stabilizes here this time around. And um, again, let me know if we run into issues again. I wanna make sure that uh, we get this recorded well and you guys can hear, uh, hear things that are going on. If you are just coming into the second half of the session, um, in your control panel for your webinar, you may raise your hand, you may use the um, questions chat box. Please feel free to hit us up with questions as, you go, as we go along and we will um, answer them either on the fly or we'll stop and we'll answer them as a group. And in case you forgot, um, I am Mary Hildinger and I am a systems consultant here at DWD Technology Group. If uh, you were already here for the first time around, you, you get to see my mug again. And we have David Overholt. David, I'm gonna have you try to speak this time. I tried to last time, but I don't think you could hear me. Can you well, hear me now? I hear you because I realized that my speakers were messed up. So I apologize. But you can hear me now? I sure can. Thank you. Awesome. Yes, okay. I am here. Yay. And if you need CPE credit, please feel free to reach out to Leah Peters. Um, she will send you a letter. Um, again, this is a second credit that is possibly available and we'll go through the 50, um, the 50 minute session to ensure that we have the proper requirements for CPE. Um, we've already got a question. If you can hold that thought for a minute for me and let me get into some of this, I will, um, I will try to answer that as best I can. I may have to take your question offline and talk directly with you about that. So. I'm gonna go ahead and get started and talk about some important things of note. Some of this, for those of you who were here earlier, uh, this will be a little bit of a repeat, I apologize, but I just wanna make sure anybody that came in new is able to um, hear the information that needs to be dis dis displayed, dispersed, losing my words today. So from a software version support, just as a reminder, Sage is itself only supporting the current version and the two prior versions, which means 2023 is the current version and they will support version 2022 and version 2021. Technically, if you have Sage 12020, you still have the ability to get the current payroll download and be able to process your payroll forms, but be aware that will be going away for next year. So we really need to keep on basically a three year cycle. You don't have to upgrade every year if you don't want to, um, but in order to stay compliant, we will need to make sure that um, you get updated on a little bit of a regular basis. Why is that? Well, this, the payroll tax update comes to us as a download from a um, basically a cloud site and the actual calculations occur through the cloud. That's why sometimes if you're having in issues with internet connectivity and you're trying to calculate your payroll taxes, you get a failure because your internet either went offline, you don't have permissions to access that resource. All of that calculation occurs up in the cloud now. Any of our tax table updates get pushed down to us. So you can install tax table updates at any point in time. It is not the um, process that it used to be. Uh, we talked about earlier, and I'm gonna repeat it again here, the three letter acronyms, the interim release download, that was the biggie for doing the 1099s. And then the tax table updates. We don't need either of these anymore. In fact, Sage does not offer them to us anymore. You need to be on a current version of Sage 100 and you need to download the actual um, payroll tax or the payroll update. 
So do we need to install the IRD? Nope, no more. It doesn't exist. If you are not running a compatible version of Sage 100, you will not be able to install the payroll update and you will not be able to generate your 1099s, W-2s, or any other associated tax reporting documents. And then this is verbiage from Sage, starting with the 2024 payroll release, we will have an N minus three support policy. So the current version and three prior payroll versions will be supported. And again, just as another reminder for this year, you need to be on version 2020 or higher in order to install payroll 2.24, which will get you the proper forms and get you the proper tax updates. Again, as a reminder, if you're using payroll and you are running Sage 100 uh, 2019 or earlier, you will need to work with your business partner or with DWD if we're your reseller to make sure that you get upgraded so that you can remain compliant. Payroll 2.24. Um, we are expecting that. I've been looking for the download the last couple of days. Right now it is still 2.23.2. So I expect 2.24.0 to come out really at about any time now, usually by mid-month I would expect. Um, what's in it? What has changed? What are some of the benefits? First of all, we can do customizable tax profiles. Uh, for those of you who have been around for a while and remember the old icky, um, you only get one local tax code unless you purchase the add-on for the multiple concurrent local taxes. We can handle multiple local jurisdictions today and that's actually been around since the advent of payroll 2.x. Um, it is a cloud-based tax calculation. Updates get pushed to you rather than you needing to pull them down. So that makes it a little bit easier on all of us, to be, to be honest. The only thing that we just have to make sure is that we regularly update the payroll aspect. And that typically is doable without completely torching everybody who might be using the software. If, you, if you've got a number of other people in and we're trying to run the, the payroll 2.2x installs, we generally can do those without a lot of conflict. What is new in 2.24.0? Uh, we talked a little bit ago about the tax profiles. Well, not only does the employee have a tax profile, but in 2.24.0, we can set up a default tax profile by earnings code. So as an example, you've got people who might be working in different jurisdictions and you set up different earnings codes. You can set up a default tax profile for a specific earning code. Um, how do I figure out what my take tax rates are? Um, there is an inquiry function that's come along here just very, very recently. And we now will have the ability to export that so that we can actually see it in a readable, really readable fashion. And then the biggest thing is the change to the installer. You must be on version 2020 or higher in order to get payroll 2.24.x installed. And that because it plays with Atrix, which is the forms generator, all of that has to be updated in order for you to get that information um, installed properly so that you can run the forms that you need. <clears throat> Excuse me. So what happens in payroll during period end processing and year end processing? Um, there is a little blurb here about what happens in the legacy version. I'm really not gonna talk to it because that is not applicable anymore. But 2018 and after, technically payroll 2.x.x .x and after, what happens? Records get purged from history when the history is beyond the years to retain. And the default went from two to four years. 
and you can make that higher. Um, so once we get past the years to retain payroll history, then those things will start getting purged from the history. Um, that has an effect on your terminated employees too. So in years past, when we terminated an employee, they would pretty much go away at the end of the year and not be in the employee lookup list. Well, they're going to be there now, but they're going to not have any information attached to them. And then after that time period elapses, then that's when they'll start going away permanently. Um, employee direct deposit. The year to date figures get set to zero. So anybody who's processing their payroll and utilizing the direct deposit functionality, we start over. Um, <clears throat> I just mentioned the terminated employees. Again, they get deleted based on the business rules, which is related to the amount of history. Um, if you have employees, there's, there's the setting for not only the termination, but then also an inactivation. So we can set employees as inactive rather than terminating them. That keeps their information around uh, until we choose to terminate and then let that history lapse. If you are using the calendar based reset time off accrual functionality, that will reset for the active employees. We have choices now in the new payroll in the, the more current um, systems where we can do it based on a calendar year or we can do it based off the employee's anniversary date. So if you're doing the calendar based, when you do the year end processing, everybody will get reset. And then of course we get updates into the new quarter and the new year. One of the things that we have noticed maybe is that it is possible to continue to process payroll without doing a proper closing at the end of each quarter. While that is possible, I still want to encourage you to do your proper closing at the end of each quarter. It just helps keep things cleaner um, because when we get into the Atrix side of things, we're gonna find that we'll be able to go back to really whatever period we need in order to review the data, especially in the current calendar year. Speaking of Atrix, again, this is the reminder, and I told you I was gonna hammer on this quite a bit here this afternoon. Uh, you do need to be on version 2020 or higher, and you need to have payroll 2.24 installed. You must have the program federal and state e-filing and reporting installed on the computer from which the forms will be printed. Um, this program is a local installation. It just, it goes, it works in tandem with Sage 100, but if you get a new computer, we have to remember to reinstall federal and state because it does not install as part of the Sage client. And then of course we have to have a current Sage 100 maintenance plan. Your payroll has to be kept up to date. Some other things that we look at here, uh, we've got the federal forms. What are the things that we can print out of Atrix? Well, uh, there's a whole slew of federal forms uh, the 940, which is the annual federal unemployment tax return, the form 941, which is the quarterly federal tax return, and the W-2s. Um, now, unlike the 1099s, we can print the, the, the governmental copies on plain paper. We don't have to do the pre-printed forms. So if you are choosing to paper file for your organization, you don't have to go out and buy forms. Um, it is recommended strongly that you get the four part perforated um, because it will print the different copies for each employee on each page. And you do need to submit to your employee a copy of instructions, whether it's on the back of the four part perforated paper or whether it is a separate copy of the instructions. That is a requirement. And a lot of people don't always do that. 
Um, if you choose to e-file your forms, Atrix can help facilitate that. They do charge additional fees because it's outside of Sage and you just would have to get registered with Atrix and fill in some information about what jurisdictions you're filing, give them the EIN number, get set up. And um, once you get that all figured out and configured, then when you're going through the process of the forms, you get the option to print or to e-file. You can facilitate the e-filing functionality and pay by credit card. What do we do with our state tax forms? Um, same kind of concept. I really can only safely speak to Indiana because that's where I am from and that's where I have done payroll returns uh, years and years and years ago. The unemployment tax form, the what we call the Indiana UC1 5A, actually that has to be e-filed these days. You can use Atrix or you go to the Indiana Department of Workforce Development website and you log in and you fill in the information that they request. Your WH1, your state withholding forms, again, there is a website that you can go to and you can record the wages and you can record the taxes that are withheld for state and local jurisdictions. Uh, so we can do these. Um, without pre-printed forms. The withholding form, the WH-1 can actually, um, can actually get printed, but the unemployment, the state will not accept a paper copy. So we have to do some form of e-filing. I do have a question here about the copy of the instructions and um, for the W-2s. And if you choose to e-file with Atrix, what Atrix does is they will actually, they can actually print and mail your employees their copy of the W-2s. You can set them up so that they can receive an email. And yes, instructions would be provided by Atrix in the event that you either have Atrix print and mail or whether they send an electronic copy of the W-2. That is a great, great, great question because that can get really confusing. Um, back to the state forms. I just came across some information here and this may not be current in your handouts because I just changed it about an hour and a half ago. Um, I have just seen information that if you are filing 10 or more employee returns, so 10 or more W-2s that you have to uh, send to the state of Indiana, you must e-file. That threshold was previously 25. The federal threshold is 250. So um, if you have 250 or more W-2s, not just current employees, but W-2s that need to get filed, the federal requires e-filing. And then depending on what your state's laws are, check with your local accountants, check with your state department of revenue, whatever that gets called, figure out what their requirements are. You can either e-file them or maybe you can still send paper copies. Um, it just depends. I speak to Indiana and Indiana is now 10 or more. So that threshold has been lowered. What about all these updates? Um, Atrix usually gets their updates. Actually, we start seeing updates just about any time now and we will see a slew of them over the next probably six weeks. Um, I have had experience where I have gotten in to do some sort of tax form related function. I would get my Atrix update and I would leave. I would come back in later that day and I would get prompted for another Atrix update. Don't be surprised. Just take the updates. And uh, this will be coming hot and heavy, like I said, for probably the next six to eight weeks. What does that look like? Um, you might get a prompt that says to verify the account information. 
go ahead and do that. If you click on the demo button, you will be able to run the forms, but they will be watermarked and you cannot submit them and you would not be able to e-file them. So make sure that you have your active internet connection, a valid payroll um, subscription, and make sure that you um, authenticate that you can process your forms. Once your account gets validated, you'll get that magical prompt, auto update, download the update, continued, expired, or cancel. I just always say do the automatic update. Um, that just makes it so much easier, gives us the opportunity to, um, excuse me, be able to get the forms and get the things updated that we absolutely need. You can manually download the update um, and go ahead and install that manually. Uh, if you do the continued expired, you will not be able to file those forms. They'll be watermarked. And then obviously if you cancel, you just run into a whole slew of trouble. I do wanna talk about the update process. And this is something that happens hot and heavy, um, if not annually, quarterly anyway, because of the, the quarterly forms. Um, the biggest thing that I'm seeing that is causing the issues with getting these updates is the users permissions on their workstation. They might not have sufficient permissions to install software. So sometimes we have to make sure that some sort of elevated permission, some sort of administrator either logs in and installs it um, or something of that nature. <clears throat> if you cannot get the automatic update to work, the one that we just saw, the automatic one that comes when this when it's offered by the software there is a manual way to pull down these updates there is a website www.sagemass.atrix.com make sure that that is allowed as um, trusted sites um, you might need help from your it people or DWD can help if we have the permissions to be able to change these settings. Make sure that the following files and executables and sites are allowed through your security tab. And make sure that your company's firewall settings are allowed to communicate with the Atrix servers. All of these things are things that we run into regularly. And at atrix.com slash sagemass, there is a spot where you can click on the link to download the, the updates, drop it onto your workstation's desktop, um, double click it to run or better yet right click and run as administrator go ahead and let that run uh, follow all I call it follow all the bouncing prompts and then try to relaunch your federal or state e-filing and reporting if you get reprompted for the automatic update make sure that you go ahead and um, click on the automatic update and just for kicks and giggles here, I am going to flip to the website. There we go. Now it's waking up. And we can get our software downloads here. I know I'm slipping through here pretty quick. They do have options for Mac and or for um, Windows, you can certainly go get whatever version is appropriate. Generally, of course, if we are running um, Sage 100, we're not doing it on a Mac platform, but that gives us the opportunity um, to get that information downloaded and installed on each workstation for which Atrix 
federal and state e-filing needs to be run. Just some little tidbits here. Um, we've got the customer portal. Um, if you do not have access to the customer portal, I would strongly encourage you to get set up. There are forms that might need to be filled out either by you or on your behalf that set you up as what's considered an authorized contact of your organization with SAGE. Once you have those um, set up, then you can go to the customer portal site. You can sign up for a portal account and through the, the portal, you have access to virtually the same knowledge base that we have it. We at DWD have access to, which is basically the same knowledge base that Sage uses. So um, if you have questions, if you have problems, if you want to look up information, the customer portal is pretty, pretty good. It gives you uh, mechanisms by which you can search. Um, you also can get yourself access to Sage City, which is a um, forum for Sage users. You can pretty much ask any question that you'd like and you might get an answer from one of us. You might get an answer from a Sage technical support person. You might get a response from a user and um, it just all, you know, whatever you need, there are lots of resources out there. If you don't remember your credentials, feel free to uh, contact Sage. They can help you um, get you your username or help you reset your username. You can reset your password if you need help with that. Um, I want to circle back to a question that um, came up and it is kind of, it's related to the 1099s, but again, because it's kind of this year end stuff, I do want to, um, I do want to, to uh, um, approach this question. W9s have a line one name shown on, name as shown on income tax return. The business puts a name here, then line two is the business name. They also put a name in here. Usually, and this is the question from the our user here today, usually that name is the billing name we have set up in AP in Sage. I'm not sure what that, was. I can't read that one. Some 1099s, don't ask for both names. And um, I often get letters back from the IRS stating that my 1099 did not match with the social security number or the business tax ID. So some changes that have occurred in the most current version of Sage 100 does revolve around this a little bit. And when I go look at a vendor and I have it set up as either a business or as a, an individual, this field here, this 1099 name field used to be called the DBA field. So if it was doing business as, but this is actually the field now that needs to be filled out. And if you're still on a version that refers to it as the DBA, this is the right field. Um, this will print on, I think it's line two of the 1099. And I covered this, I know I talked about this a little bit in the um, user group last month. Unfortunately, it's escaping my brain cells right at the moment but you could have a potentially separate address, but this should be the address that reflects the taxpayer ID number. This address is where you're sending payment. This is from whom you're acquiring goods or services. But the 
1099 information, all these new fields are available in more current versions of SAGE 100. So I think might have been on SAGE 100 2022 that these fields first came into existence. Um, so if, if you are not on that version and you're having some struggles, we might have to take a look at that. Um, and then of course, certainly be aware that we probably will need to be upgrading you next year anyway. So it's very, very possible. Um, you might not see these fields in your installation, but they are out there now. And those are some of the updates that have come as a result. And then just the kicks and giggles in the payroll. Um, you notice that prompt that just came up that says that no users, and I, I clicked through it very quickly, no users were set up for service notifications. There is a spot in our payroll setup section. Let me blow my screen up here a little bit. Service notification maintenance. This probably would be something really good that I would recommend that we get set up at least for one individual in your organization because if there are service interruptions, if their website goes down for any reason, it would be nice for somebody on our end to know about that. And then we can see here that because of the new structure, the new payroll, you get told that a payroll update is available. Do you want to download it and install it? Sure, why not? So you can go ahead and update those things as often as they get pushed to you. And that's really not a bad idea. When we get into the service notification, then we can either, we can go by the user login. And if you've got a, a number of people, you pick one to as many as you want. And you can pick whether or not we use the email address that is defined in their user maintenance or we can set up a separate email address and that address will receive notifications when there are service interruptions from the SAGE tax calculation engine. I get a recap of the taxes that have been updated and it also gives me a guide um, that I can go to on the internet to see what has changed in the online payroll tax database. I can run the uh, payroll status check utility on the utilities menu to see if any changes to your tax settings are needed. What is the payroll status check utility? That is under our utilities menu. And that is this function here, the status check. This is good to run, I would say, at least once a year. And we can see, oh, I've got some errors in my tax profiles. That's a, that could be a problem. I have some warnings in my company tax groups. OK, I probably want to look at those to see what they are. And what I see from the warning, I click on either the error or the warning and I get some additional information. And it says in the federal company tax group, I'm missing the additional GL account values. Well, my experience tells me that those additional GL account values have to do with the prior COVID pay taxation things that we had to do over the past few years. Since that's no longer viable, I'm not going to worry about it. What about my errors? Oh. I've got a couple of sample tax profiles and oh, tax profiles not current with the CLAD data. So what do I do? I can get into the tax profile maintenance and I can try to fix any of those issues that might be out of whack. So we've got ways to get to this information and um, figure out why those things need corrected. 
There's also a little utility here, a little um, hammer and screwdriver that will fix. So I can go ahead and highlight and fix. And now when I rerun my setup, my tax profiles have been corrected and I no longer have errors. Not only do I test the setup, but then I can also look at other local taxes and see if there's anything out there. It's used to detect and create missing payroll tax records. Um, this helps fill in the employee information with full payroll tax data. Even though it might be zero, it's still going to go ahead and fill that stuff in for us to give us um, the appropriate information. The tax update is a manual way to launch the tax download and installation. If, um, if I haven't seen an update in a while, I can still go ahead and um, pull it and I can pull it whenever I want to pull it. Once I have run that update, I can run the report and that will tell me the latest date that an update was installed. I can go back and see prior dates that the tax update got installed. I can see what is in that tax update just by running the report. And it just tells me that I've got new groups. I've added some jurisdictions. Okay. I have added a new tax rule and it's going to be valid until the year 3000. I don't think I'm going to see that. So that's okay by me. And then certainly if I want to get to the website, I can click on that link and it actually takes me to the changes and gives me an idea of what has changed previously and what is changing for the coming year. This is great information. And for those of you who are managing your payroll, I would absolutely recommend that you go ahead and dig around and take a look at that stuff to make sure that you stay compliant because that's what this all turns out to be. When I go into my period end, of course, here's going to be the um, verification. Make sure that I'm happy good. Now, some people, especially during the course of the year, they might have some anxiety because they don't see the exact year. That's okay. I still select the form that I want. And this just tells me that this version of the software has not been updated to the 2023 forms yet. As soon as I select it, I'm going to get process or prompted for my update. And it's mad at me because I don't have a good FEIN. That is my fault. Here's the prompt for the automatic update. Just do it. If you run into issues, let us know or let your reseller know. And we will be more than happy to uh, help you get around that. We might need to have your IT intervene for us so that we can actually have proper permissions to do the installations. And then we go through the process of getting all the updates. If you keep this updated more regularly, this process is not quite as ugly. I know some people only do this once a year, and so it's getting a whole year's worth of updates, maybe two years, depending on the last time you did it. And for those of you who are running your 1099s, you're gonna get all of these other forms too. So please be patient. Uh, if you're not doing payroll forms, it still is the same engine that runs both and both will get updated whether you need them or not. And I've got another question that just came in. Um, 
Do we want to update to payroll 2.24 after the last payroll for 2023? Um, I would say that would be a good thing to do. I would say go ahead and update it as soon as it comes out. Again, I'm not 100% sure when that is expected to be delivered in the download portal, but um, as soon as it becomes available, I would be inclined to go ahead and install it. I know I'm working on some upgrades for some folks to get them caught up to at least the 2020 world. And so I, right now I can only install 2.23, but as soon as 2.24 becomes available, I absolutely want to get that out there for them. Right. I think the question was, do I need to wait till after my last payroll? No, that's kind of what I'm saying is let's, okay. if, as soon as it comes out, I would be inclined to go ahead and install it. Yeah, and I got notification the master developers should have this on Friday, so I would expect within the next week or so. Yeah, it's usually mid-month when that comes out, so next week would be 13th to the 15th. And then, of course, we get into our form. For those of you, can I get a quick show of hands? How many of you do these forms? Hand, yeah, quite a few of you. Awesome. So you are fairly familiar with what these things look like. And I'm not really showing you anything terribly new. The cool thing, though, is that once the updates occur, we know that we are going to work with whatever that year's version is. And just as a side note, I've had some people come to me and say, hey, I need to process a form from 2020. Unfortunately, I can't from Atrix because once the, once the forms have been updated, the only version that is viable is the current year. So I can't retroactively file data with a current form, but if I have already processed a form and I have I've already saved that off. I can go back and reprint it and it will reprint the proper form. It's just that it won't let me, um, it won't let me generate a form from an historical period. So we're really working in the current year. For the actual forms that Atrix provides for us. And then we get the delightful fill in all the red spots and anything else that it asks for. And then once it's done being edited, we go through a review and we can then choose whether we are going to print or e-file. We can actually e-file the 941s. There is a cost attached to it, but it is absolutely doable. If you want to, um, set up a subscription with Atrix, you, you are welcome to go into their uh, unlimited e-file package, get something set up with that, then they will just charge that against your subscription rather than you paying individually each time. And as we see, I am looking at 2023 forms now and I have the current revision, which was done in March of 2023. When we get into the first quarter of next year, of course, this will turn into a 2024 form. And we'll just go ahead and use that as we move forward in time. All right. At this point, I want to go ahead and open it up for anybody else that has any other questions. You are welcome to type in the questions box. And you are always welcome to hit up David or me um, at any point. And if we can't answer it, we're going to find somebody who can. And again, as a reminder, if you would like to receive CPE, um, you are welcome to contact Leah 
at lpeters at dwdtechgroup.com. Just let her know that you attended the payroll portion or if you were there um, for both parts of it, just tell her you were here for both parts of it. And we have recorded this session, so we will be sending out recordings probably tomorrow or the next day. It depends on when we get that all buttoned up and tidied up. But before the end of the week, I would think that you should get um, a copy of the recording and you can revisit whatever is in here. Again, I am Mary. Uh, it has been an absolute pleasure chatting with you folks today. David and Leah, thank you so very much for uh, supporting me. Um, oh, I do have a question here. Any feedback on IRS change of 401 catch-up contribution changes? I have not come across anything. I would probably have to hit the website and see what's out there, I would go out to um, irs.gov and pull that information from there. Or certainly check with your tax accountants if you work with somebody of that nature. Mary, thank you for doing this, I appreciate it. Oh, absolutely, it's a pleasure. Thank you all for being here today. Yes, I've got some people so would that IRS change need a, a change in SAGE? I guess that's what the question is. Well, and that's, I need to find out, I need to double check what version um, is currently being run. So um, if you've got issues that you're not able to um, get to the latest and greatest tax rules, and since that's kind of where this is related, I go to my deduction codes we have various tax rules and I'll just pick one here do, 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 do. pension plan so there are catch-ups that are available and not just Heinz um, there's the Roth 401 catch-up deduction and that would be for um, employees that are 55 and older, I think it is. Unfortunately, I don't remember off the top of my head. Um, there's the 401k. So if you've got a traditional 401k, there is a tax rule that is out there that helps um, facilitate the calculations. If you're doing a Roth 401k, if you're doing a simple plan, if you've got a 403b because you are a not-for-profit organization, um, so theoretically, yes, the, the rules are out there and I will certainly get you a call, Larry, to discuss so further. I'm curious now because we've broached this, if you could take another minute or two, are there limits on those when you select them? That they're now not increased or something? That they're not. Is, um, I don't think it forces the limit because I'm really putting you on the spot, but <laughs> yeah, you are a little bit, but you know what? I need to know these things, right? I am cool with that. So let's just set up a simple uh, 401 catch up. Oh, K E T. Yeah, something like that. Catch up. Get it. <laughs> and I have to pick that it is a pension or a cafeteria plan if I want to apply a tax rule and that is see it doesn't force an amount so you could here. put any limit you wanted in there you could put any limit in there yes and and what i have seen people do is they might have one set of deduction codes for their employees who are 55 or older that has the higher limit or i might see them have two deduction codes that will work in tandem so it one just the 401k yeah. and one for the catch up yes. say again david to me. Uh, i say you, in that case i have one for the 401k and another one for the catch up right okay but whether or not there are specific rules on what those limits are and what types of withholdings 
I don't have those answers right at the top of my head, but I can certainly reach out. I think maybe we answered that question, but you might give them a call anyway, just to be sure. Exactly. So, awesome. Well, again, um, thank you all so very much. And um, if you have any questions, if you need any help, please feel free to reach out and we'll be happy to assist in any way that we can. All right. Thanks so much, everybody.